Thank you for tuning in today to watch the presentations that are part of the Telehealth Initiative Bootcamp. To give you a little bit of context, this initiative is a collaboration between the American Medical Association, the Florida Medical Association, the Massachusetts Medical Society, and the Texas Medical Association. The initiative is funded by a very generous grant from the Physicians Foundation. When we embarked on this journey in January of 2020, we had no idea what was about to unfold that would cause us to have to rapidly develop and deploy resources to assist physicians, not only in our states, but nationwide as they adopted and adapted to telemedicine. This boot camp was initially scheduled to be an in-person meeting, but due to the shelter in place orders, we had to visit, we had to pivot to a virtual meeting. So I do hope that you enjoy these presentations and I hope that you find them helpful as you refine your own telemedicine efforts. The first presentation is a presentation by Dr. Russell Libby, a pediatrician and telehealth enthusiast. The other presentations are properly introduced, so you'll know who those speakers are uh, when they begin. But again, thank you for joining, and I hope you find the information useful. We decided that telemedicine really was a feature that we needed to add into the regular repertoire of physician services. If we were going to lead this industry, we needed to be the ones who did these kinds of services and understood how to best implement and use them. So we realized that there were a lot of docs who thought about it, really felt that the standard of care was hands-on medicine and were really not ready to uh, take that move forward. And we decided, well, you know, we're going to have to create the playbook. We're going to have to help our medical organizations, our state medical societies, find ways to assist their docs in developing uh, the repertoire of services that they could provide uh, through telemedicine. So who could have known that at this point, we would see the world turn on a dime? Uh, and I will go over later what happened to my practice over this course of 30 days in the month of 31 days in the month of March. Um, it was pretty insane. It was an astounding transition from where you could have counted on your hands the number of patients and doctors who were doing uh, telemedicine as a, as a primary way of interacting with patients to where all of a sudden it was upwards of 95%. And if they hadn't implemented it yet, they knew that they were going to soon. And in some ways that's good, in some ways that's bad. A lot of people jumped uh, at uh, platforms and uh, structures that weren't necessarily the best ones. And those are the things that we were trying to create resources for in the TTI. Now, when we look at how we as physicians were working at that time, we were very focused on our medical homes. We wanted to uh, develop the way to best at provide services and take advantage from the economic opportunities of value-based payments. Um, there was still Teladoc out there, um, but there were lots of other ones too, and they all started to float to the surface. And if we noticed what they were advertising, it was pretty, 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 um, pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It was, you know, you go through a couple of algorithms. Uh, we decide, yes, you need an antibiotic because rarely will we say no. We decide, yes, <clears throat> you need some um, erectile dysfunction medicine or some acne treatment or whatever it was. And patients found this is pretty easy. I could get on at 11 o'clock at night, I'm gonna do it. So as we changed that, um, we realized that it does fit in. Um, doctors need to start to do this. And of course, uh, we started to realize we could get a lot better uh, outcomes from doing that. So I'm gonna give you a little perspective on my group. As I said, as I said we have to take, uh, primary care. We've got 18 clinicians, four offices. We are Somebody should mute. It, it's showing up as Felipe Gomez, so there's a lot of background noise coming from you. If you could mute, please. Dr. Libby, I'm going to mute all, and then you'll need to unmute. So we are PCMH level three. Um, we have uh, a relationship with the primary care IPA. We developed an ACO. We have great contracts. We have a lot of gain share opportunities. We have a really very fluid practice. Um, but we are in a high 
high density area and um, not many of our docs wanted to stay very late every day. They were willing to come in well, 730 and stay till 630 maybe. But people were looking for after hours care. Uh, we had a lot of traffic. Uh, schools didn't get out until 3.30. Uh, and people started to recognize that there was convenience. And so about a year and a half ago, I started to investigate telemedicine. Uh, I started with some payer-based platforms doing mostly uh, mental health issues, uh, ADHD, medication follow-ups, things of that nature. But I realized this was a, a real parallel experience. I was doing it through a payer-based platform. Uh, I had to reproduce the encounter in my EHR and it was really not working quite as smoothly as it should. So I talked to my EHR vendor, happens to be a pediatric specialty uh, EMR. Um, they were receptive, but it really wasn't on their radar at the time. Started to work then with a specialty specific newbie, somebody who was developing his platform and wanted to have all the input he could on how it could best work with uh, a, a pediatric practice and try to develop a method by which we could really create the resources that we needed to be able to get that buy-in at my practice level. So it was, it was an endeavor. It took, it took months for people to open their eyes, bother reading the emails, look at the documents that I devised and developed to help them understand how and where we could use it in the office. But I knew that we needed to set it up as part of our regular office day and that everybody in the office should be able to do that and I did have the vision that we would use it for a lot of different purposes, including um, after hours, including weekends. But initially, it was just get used to using it. Uh, certainly, we had um, uh, the ability in our office setting, and we had a, a very, uh, let's say, a capable patient population being in a very, uh, let's say, very nice part of Northern Virginia outside of DC. But we really had to set it up. So the big thing was, really understanding how to separate the little tasks and the understanding of what you were doing with each part of your office operation. And that involved the front desk, it involved my triage nurses, it involved my appointment uh, phone uh, operators, it involved the business office, it involved my MAs uh, reminding patients uh, when they see them that they could do a follow-up with a telemedicine visit. It was one of the endeavors that really you had to break into parts and then bring back together, truly executive functioning. Um, and we did that. We were able to do that and make telemedicine a standard office service. Uh, we started with simple care groups, conjunctivitis, um, you know, simple things, asthma, allergy care, things of that nature. And the docs started putting an hour and then two hours into their daily schedule, often during the times when we had some lull in terms of patient visits. Uh, be them in the middle of the day or at certain times uh, in the early evening. And we were able to really come to discover the doctors enjoyed it. They actually felt they were getting a very good experience out of it, and so did the patients. So those, those early things, as we were saying, uh, neurobehavioral psychopharm, triage issues, uh, low acuity, um, college-age kids who were away at college and uh, needed to get their meds refilled or you wanted to check in on them for their anxiety or depression, whatever, early morning, evening. And really the big thing was reminding the staff and reminding the patients that it was there and that they could do it. Um, we did a lot with our website. We did a lot with uh, our portal. We did as much as we could with Facebook. And we just tried to create the opportunity for patients it was taken up, but not that great. And then, of course, along comes uh, COVID, our, our incredible life-changing event here, probably the most significant thing that most of us will encounter from a, a social um, and world view perspective in our lives. You know, it was one of those things that we were aware of, I guess, in January, February, um, it really didn't seem like much more than a distance threat. And we were told it was uh, some foreign country's disease, not ours. Um, we weren't prepared. We really didn't know what to expect, um, but we did have some sense of fear. We knew that there were kinds of uh, uh, viruses like this, the coronavirus that, that could create a uh, pretty severe disease and could be spread rather, relatively easy. 
But then all of a sudden it starts in a nursing home. It's in, uh, in Washington state. And then all of a sudden we start to see the sparks blowing across the country. And the next thing we know, uh, it, it is an epidemic. This pandemic has become an epidemic in, in every major urban area around the country. Some more acutely, some more quickly than others. But now we're watching Manhattan and it's, it's, it's like, what is Kurt Russell was in that movie, Escape from Manhattan, uh, or Escape from New York or whatever. But uh, I, I can't even imagine um, what it's like having to get your elevator to go up to, um, uh, to your uh, floor if you're living in a high rise there. Anyway, um, with all this and with all this trepidation, we know that telemedicine makes sense. And the, the actual sea change that occurred in our uh, medical care providing uh, was astounding. I, I can't say that anything doctors have done in, in the history of medicine have changed so quickly. In a period of a month, the, uh, the process uh, of transitioning from really being not particularly interested in telemedicine, uh, or at least peripherally only, to it becoming a major way to deliver care uh, took place. Um, and you know what? So do the feds. Uh, they, uh, they agree this is the best way to contain patients in a safe place. Uh, unfortunately, not all our payers are agreeing. So yes, it becomes the charming charming of health care, right? Um, you can't even get enough of it anymore. And um, it's been coming off the shelf as quick as it can get out there. Um, you want to screen for these patients. Of course, uh, one of the things that we discovered was that uh, we really didn't want to see all those patients in our office and we were advised not to. We didn't want our staff uh, to get sick. And of course, who had any PPE? Um, and at that point, uh, we knew that we had to start screening so we wouldn't send them to the ER and overload them with unnecessary visits from people who weren't that terribly sick. So we started to screen uh, our patient population for those who were worried they might have been exposed or had a family member who traveled or uh, had some simple symptoms or something of that nature. And so we, uh, we started to screen on telemedicine. Um, and then patients, of course, started canceling appointments. Um, our local health systems were totally unprepared. We had no testing, especially in kids. Uh, probably two and a half weeks into it, we had one testing center, and it was probably 25 miles from uh, that northern Virginia area. Now it's improved a bit. But it is a really, really difficult situation. Then, of course, the health systems and uh, the feds and everyone else said, you're in lockdown. Um, you're not going to go anywhere. You're not going to uh, unnecessary medical visits. You're not getting your elective surgeries. And all of a sudden, we had an incredible downturn in the number of visits. Um, so as we got into this at the practice, uh, we started to think, uh, how can we protect our staff? How can we keep them employed? How can we stay open and continue with generating revenue? Um, who's going to come to the office? And, you know, is, will it be our little kids for well checks? Well, a lot of them were not particularly happy or uh, feeling safe doing that. Um, who's going to work there? Because we had people who were afraid to come into the office and we had some seniors, uh, myself included, who really were in a high risk category and shouldn't be seeing patients at this point. And if we did open, would we be able to get labs? And what kind of labs would we get? And could we give our immunizations? I mean, that's a huge piece of pediatrics. Uh, our revenue generation is you know, probably 30% from these kinds of uh, uh, financial outlays. And so how do you develop a financial plan? And it doesn't really matter what the CARES Act says. Uh, there is a huge stress and an impetus for us to find other ways to provide care. So we started doing telemedicine 24-7, uh, and this will just give you an outline of what happens in a primary care office when uh, the COVID comes into town. Um, you know, in the first week of March, it was pretty standard. We had uh, 933 visits. Only five of them actually were telemedicine visits. Uh, in the second week, uh, it was 896, pretty standard still. You know, we're sort of getting into that phase where Kids aren't getting as many viruses. Maybe that was part of it, but nonetheless, a few more telemedicines third week. As this wave came around, we saw office visits drop by more than half. And we had 202 telemedicine visits that week. And by the fourth week, 
Uh, we were down to 152 office visits in four offices. Of course, we've closed two of them to regular visits and have two open six days a week now. But 266 telemedicine visits, and this uh, more or less shows you that uh, total patient visits and what's happened. If it hasn't come to you yet, and for many of you, I'm sure it has, um, it will be there very soon. And with that, it's not just the visits, it's what you can do during those visits that generates the revenue, uh, and all of a sudden that is gone. But at the same token, you see that the transition we went through from that first week uh, with mostly office visits to where now telemedicine actually is our major vehicle for patient visits. And in fact, right now, um, we are working with our payers. Uh, we're developing the templates and working with our uh, EMR company to develop uh, the kinds of um, uh, tools that we need to be able to do our preventive care. Um, a big part of our, our business is taking care of kids under the age of two and giving them timely immunization. So we've developed a lot of support and we're trying to get our payers. We've got two local payers willing to pay us uh, uh, at par with face-to-face -face, uh, well checks. We're developing strategies for doing drive-by immunizations. Um, we're working on it. It is every day. It's a different day in the office, uh, a different way and a different strategy, and we're learning on the run. Um, Fortunately, uh, we have seen that uh, we are able to, um, to adapt and adjust. I don't know if we'll catch up to those revenues as quickly as we need to, but we're doing everything we can to get there. We're promoting it, as I said, every which way we can. Uh, we've made ourselves available for walk-ins and scheduling uh, anything that people want. Uh, in particular, we've developed a, a module around anxiety and depression since a lot of kids have that as a baseline and uh, being isolated away from your social opportunities, not being able to finish your, uh, your plans for going to college and probably not even going to college in the fall uh, is a pretty stressful event for a lot of kids and we feel that we can do a lot of good for them. We've developed those templates, as I said, we've uh, got surveys and screens um, and we can use those and get paid for those. Um, you need to pressure your EMR vendor to find ways to integrate this platform um, and not necessarily always pick the one that's easiest and the one that's most available, but one that has some perspective as to how you can implement and make it meaningful for your practice for the years to come. And those are some of the resources we've developed and hope to help you use uh, as we go through this process in the TTI. And you have to bill. You have to bill for the, every service you do. Now you have phone uh, codes that you can actually bill for through Medicare. You have, uh, and many of the payers as well. You have uh, nurse care that you can bill for. You have to make sure you find every place you can bill and do that. Uh, it is not uh, being abusive, it's actually being uh, utilitarian, it's being the way you have to perform and the patients need that service, they'll appreciate that service um, and you need to be able to, to provide it. Um, your EMR might be able to select out patients who need specific types of chronic or other periodic visits, uh, refills, uh, and may be at risk for prior diagnoses that may be of substance or significance. You need to build your billing process into your templates, of course, and then you have to monitor your, uh, your payment and make sure you're getting it in a timely fashion at the rates that are reasonable that uh, either you've negotiated or are required by your state because we do know that payers right now are sitting on a large, let's say, wheelbarrow of cash. They aren't paying for a lot of things at the hospital. Yeah, they'll claim that uh, that intensive care potential is gonna ruin them. Uh, many of them won't pay for that either. Um, it's going to be an interesting outcome, but I think that uh, one of the things we need to uh, really advocate for at our state level is, um, is to get some of those savings that they are experiencing uh, and to share them with physician practices up front. We need it now, and, and the CARES Act isn't going to save uh, many or all practices. Uh, it may help. It may take us through a two or three months of transition but it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a hard road. And if they want to have access to care once this is said and done, and hopefully that'll be soon, uh, they're going to need to help us. And they have the cash. They should be sharing it. Um, we want to encourage our patients to stay in their medical home. Uh, we want to make sure our payers are paying for those visits at face-to-face -face rates. And that 
more than anything, at least for us as pediatricians, and as we get further into this, they need to include those preventive care codes in those, uh, 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 those payment uh, paradigms. And they shouldn't be modifying anything that we're doing. So what are some of the dark sides of COVID and what it has done in this incredible surge for doctors to incorporate telemedicine? Well, one thing is that the quick uptake has sometimes precipitated people buying the wrong product and for the wrong reasons. And right now it seems okay, um, you know, uh, they've suspended HIPAA, uh, but not for long, you can be sure. And, you know, some states have even suspended medical liability, but you can be sure that's not for long. And any uh, lawyer worth his hoots gonna be able to work his way around that. Uh, so you have to be cognizant of the legal issues around this. You wanna use a secure platform. Um, you don't want to pick something that doesn't really have uh, an inclination to support the kind of subspecialty you're in. Uh, many of them have been developed over the years uh, that help to support uh, specialties and can really be something that you can have a long term, uh, let's say, evolution with. They have uh, uh, different kinds of templates that fit your specific set of diagnoses. They have uh, billing paradigms that help you to find the best way and most efficient and and uh, appropriate way to bill for the services you provide. Uh, a lot of these platforms are just literally audiovisual uh, platforms that don't necessarily provide all that. So we have to be careful. There's a lot of opportunists out there, obviously in the PPE world, uh, we've all dealt with uh, people wanting to sell us masks for $4 a piece and uh, you can smell uh, the pie cooking in the oven through it. Um, CMS uh, certainly, has relaxed its rules. It's amazing to me that we have spent so much for so long lobbying for them to release us from some of those rules. And in one fell swoop, <laughs> they have just pushed them off the table. We are remarkably uh, blessed with some of those changes, but others aren't necessarily great. Um, they're gonna let anybody do anything from anywhere. I'm not sure that's a great idea. Uh, we have to maintain this physician-led healthcare, and that's really an important thing for us. Um, Facility costs, they're going to go on. Uh, we're going to be getting very close to a margin that starts to put us into negative territory and we're going to see practices close. We're going to see a lot of jobs lost. In fact, the healthcare sector was probably next, let's say after the uh, hospitality industry was the largest job loss sector in, um, in, the, in the country over the last two, two weeks. Uh, and doctors are gonna get burned out. I don't know about you, but every day it's like there's a whole new territory and this quicksand gets deeper with COVID related issues, practice uh, frailty issues, all the things we need to do. And of course, television. Um, all we see is news about how pessimistic people are and how horrible it is. Reruns, there's nothing new, nothing good to watch on television. And sports, my God, we have to watch reruns of old games. Getting sick of that one too. And I'm sorry to say that some of those interlopers are still thriving. So what are the uh, silver linings that we might find in those clouds? Well, we are seeing more health information te technology interoperating, which is a huge thing for us, something that we've been trying to invest in, trying to break down the, the proprietary walls and get to happen, it's happening. Um, we're getting more connected to the medical home. If you could establish that relationship with your patients, they trust you on the telemedicine mod, uh, platform you're gonna find that you have a much more dedicated patient population. They aren't gonna to go to those uh, consumer directed uh, outlets. They're gonna come back to you. They wanna have that relationship. We're seeing better outcomes. I think you're certainly seeing reduced care costs, but there are payment opportunities within the situation. And as I said, the CMS rules changes uh, have really made a difference too. Uh, hopefully people will have a better diet. Some will binge, but some will just buy healthy foods. And hopefully that's what we'll see. And certainly pollution's down significantly. And most of us have just turned off the TV because we don't have any sports to watch. We're sick of those old games and we aren't into the bad news anymore. Um, there are some golden linings as well. And I think that the biggest one is that doctors basically have realized telemedicine is feasible and it is actually a, a very uh, practical part of their patient uh, care and their practice operations. Uh, and that many of the value-based contracts that we've been sort of more or less corralled into participating in, and most of us have, 
uh, actually will find that there are rewards and uh, margins to be created by virtue of the cost containment that we can create through better monitoring and interaction with our patients through telemedicine. And I would say that, you know, in the sad but but strong uh, presence of physicians uh, leading the healthcare charge in this incredible uh, war, uh, we aren't the military, but we have been elevated to uh, a hero status, I think. It's remarkable to see what doctors have done, how they've stepped up, and how they've put their lives on the line to help patients. And I think that we're seeing an incredible resurgence of appreciation for who we are, what we've dedicated our lives to do, and how that happens. So this is not one that I wanted to include. That's okay, but this was. Um, it is a surreal experience. Uh, I feel like I'm uh, in a Salvador Dali landscape. So thank you all, and uh, um, I will turn it back over to uh, uh, the, um, the group. Thanks, Dr. Libby. Meg, I believe we have a couple of questions, at least one. Do you want to take that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Okay, um, let me start. So, uh, yeah, um, Chris from MMS um, says, they'd love to do well child and adult visits, but the need for a thorough exam seems to be the limiting factor. Um, can someone address what level of exam is needed? Dr. Libby, do you wanna kick that one off? I sure can. Uh, it's remarkable when you get a family on the phone. First of all, those of us who do practice medicine realize, of course, the history and that interaction is a huge piece. Obviously, there are some kids with uh, disabilities or other chronic conditions or acute uh, signs and symptoms that may require a physical exam, but it's remarkable what you can observe uh, through the telescreen. Uh, and you can ask parents to do maneuvers. I know we have adjusted our templates uh, to reflect what we see. Does the child look like they're hearing normally? Are they socially interactive in an appro age appropriate fashion? Um, take off their shirt, let me watch them breathe. Uh, are they in any respiratory distress? Is that respiratory rate pretty normal? Um, are their 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 uh, nares flaring? I mean, there are different things that you can use as the indices and you put those into your physical exam. Uh, if a baby is uh, is screaming a lot or you know, a child has got belly pain, you can ask the parent to, to touch the belly. Uh, you can see the reaction on their face. I mean, there are things that you can do and if you feel worried about that particular uh, exam, then you have to sometimes have them come in for uh, uh, an actual in-office visit, or if they look more severe, you send them to the uh, emergency room. But once you've gone through this a number of times, uh, you realize that, that you're really, um, you are capable of observing a lot. You've learned a lot. There are some tools out there. Um, there are some that'll look at the pharynx, some that'll look at the ears, some uh, apps that you can uh, attach to phones that will uh, give you uh, breath sounds. Uh, you can get ambulatory ultrasound. You can get all kinds of things that people can use. And I think that what we'll find as part of this telehealth initiative is, uh, is that there are other attributes that uh, we've been exploring that will be shared through the course of time and will be implemented and offered to you in ways that will allow you to then adjust and adapt. I'll, I'll take one little thing about this, Dr. Garfalo. We're actually having um, a current conversation with the national um, chapter of pediatric on the same um, on the same issue, and we've talked to Dr. Libby as well, um, uh, and we talked to the AMA folks, um, and we're hoping to to talk to the national chapter as well. Um, um, on this particular issue regarding the wellness and um, the preventative care visits? I think they have to be maintained. And I think that uh, we have no idea how long this is gonna go on. It could be for months and the after effect could go on for months and families that need a lot of the developmental, psychological and family support uh, need to contact and connect with us. If we have time for two more quick questions before moving on, um, one was from Kuling from Florida. Is is there a good telemedicine course specific to exams? And um, Dr. Levy, do you want to take that one? And then Matt, if if there's anything following up that you want to layer in, I, you know, and I will just say over course of of four weeks, 
the transition of hundreds of thousands of doctors from completely ignoring telemedicine to completely endorsing and embracing it has been incredible. I don't think that necessarily all those resources have evolved. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure that um, we will work on creating those and make them uh, standard for sharing with all of our state medical organizations in ways that can help uh, everyone everywhere. Agreed. And then Drew from um, MMS says, to what extent can remote patient monitoring be prioritized to take care of vulnerable populations and any suggestions for kind of business model sustainability as a result of that? Um, Basan, do you want to start us off? And then Stacey, you might have some thoughts on that too from our ROI work. Um, so I will say it, it really depends on your, so what is your projection for this time period on what are you prioritizing on? So it just it really depends on your, your patient mix and your, your population, your sick population. Um, and I think this is part of the business plan that you will put for your office on how are you going to triage or how are you currently being triaging? So are you, um, it's like your, your sick ones, you know, sick patients first, or you're, you're, you're coming um, to your remote patients. Um, after, so it's, this is, I think it really depends on your business model of what you're trying to do for this current period. And I think it would be also according to the time. So if you're planning, you know, a month, three months, six month plan, um, because we don't know how long this can last and hopefully it would not last long. So I think it really depends on your, your patient case and uh, your patient case mix and, and their equity level. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Bisan. Um, and we do have a, a playbook that lays out some kind of considerations for, well, it's a full playbook on remote patient monitoring and using that in practice, um, but specifically to the business model kind of return on investment aspect of this. Um, you know, there are the codes that are available now. So, um, you know, that is at least something that we can start using. Those are covered um, and they were covered pre-COVID. Um, but uh, we've really um, embarked on kind of a, it's a longer project um, around kind of trying to um, create a full resource calculator around the ROI for digital health and the implementation of digital health. And um, I think uh, some, sometimes naturally you go to the financial aspects when you start to talk about ROI, but um, there are other things that maybe aren't necessarily um, you know, on the income statement or, you know, you aren't going to see in revenue, but you can think about um, when you're using remote patient monitoring. So for instance, if you are leveraging that tool for some of these populations, um, is that going to eliminate some of your no-shows that ultimately then, you know, you can open, have those slots available for patients coming in, or maybe, you know, you don't need these patients to come in, you're able to remote um, remotely monitor them so that just opens up access on your schedule for other types of more acute situations that you might incur. So those are kind of some of the ways we're starting to think about how you translate some traditionally maybe non-financial aspects of healthcare and, and turn it into that kind of dollar sign. So that's definitely something we can stay connected on and happy to kind of even talk a little bit further offline about that. Um, I want to just say a little thing about the, the, the previous question. Um, I know Shannon had done the, um, the podcast uh, with one of the physicians um, in this matter for conducting a physical exam. And we have one of our cohort as well here, Dr. Kate Atkinson, had done a small video as well to give us some tips of uh, because she had uh, been doing telemedicine now for quite some time since um, COVID started. Um, and, and she, she gave some tips and we're actively, um, and I can send this to the group as well. Um, and Shannon, probably if you wanna share your podcast as well. Thank you, Bisan, we will do. Let's go ahead and uh, move on to our next presentation, which I think will address some of the questions that we're seeing around telehealth reimbursement. We're certainly seeing a lot of waivers come out um, that are affecting now, but even long-term we need to think about this. <coughs> Very pleased to have with us today, Dr. Zeke Silva, who is co-chair of AMA's Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group. He's a radiologist, TMA member here in, from San Antonio, Texas. Um, he's with the South Texas Radiology Group, medical director of radiology with Methodist Texas, 
Methodist Hospital and Methodist Ambulatory and Surgical Hospital and an adjunct professor of radiology at UT Health. So thank you, Dr. Silva, within your busy schedule for taking thanks. time to be with us today. And I will now turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Shannon. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen share going. And if you would, Shannon, just confirm a couple of things. One, confirm you can see the screen okay and confirm you can hear me okay. I can see the screen just fine and I can hear you uh, very well, thank you. <clears throat> Perfect. So again, I, I want to just start by complimenting Dr. Libby's presentations. I think some of the, and some of the follow-up questions, some of the content that was there, I'm going to try to touch on within the context of this lecture, but I think some of the, the, the points I'm going to share may, may prompt additional questions, and I know we have plenty of time to discuss. I was on a call yesterday, and some of you may have listened to it. So what CMS and what the White House are doing is they're having periodic calls. They're calling it you know, experiences from the front lines. And, and, and it's just to show the level of interest for obvious reasons that this disease is carrying. There were about anywhere from three to 4,000 people joining each of those calls. And we were on this panel. I was one of the panel members. And of the eight or nine individuals that were talking about hospitals without walls and, and surge preparation, almost every one of them discussed the role of telehealth and their ability to deal with the crisis. In fact, one, and this is one of the more remarkable stories I've ever heard, one of the presenters, Ted Long, he, he's in New York City, made a reference to telehealth. Now, to be fair, this was an audio telephone type communication, but what they're doing in New York is when they receive 911 calls to their call center in a manner that six months ago, every one of those individuals would have had an ambulance sent out, would have been evaluated and likely gone to the hospital. A significant percentage of those interactions and those phone calls are being transferred immediately to a telehealth physician and he or she is helping to triage that patient and make decisions before the ambulance is sent out and before that patient ends up at the hospital. I mean, it just shows you to build on Dr. Libby's points and others just the role that telehealth is playing. And I, and I just want to make the point, and this is really to the credit of everyone on this call, what we're seeing is the momentum that we've built up to this point in time is being accelerated at a rate that none of us could have predicted. And we should be, the public, the medical community, we as physicians, we as patients, should be grateful that we've reached this point. It's, it's hard to imagine if we hadn't gotten as far along as we have, what the potential direction and outcome would have been. That said, let me start, and, and, and Dr. Libby mentioned a three-year timeline that he was working on, on his efforts and sort of prompting what he was accomplishing. So kind of in a similar time frame, this goes back to about 2016. The AMA recognized a lot of the same dynamics that Dr. Libby described. And what we recognized was that as this technology, as this innovation, as this need, as this expectation was becoming real and necessary, that we needed to have a physician voice in the process. And we needed to have a physician presence to guide those discussions. And in early 2017, we formed a group. And as, as was mentioned by Shannon, I, I have the privilege of co-chairing that organization. And it's the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group. And I wanna briefly kind of show kind of how we thought about this at that level. And then we'll kind of go into some payment reimbursement discussions. But what we do is we started sort of to the left of the screen and we, we looked at the innovation and we just asked a simple question, you know, does this work? I mean, is this from a clinical perspective ready for prime time? And we started to aggregate an evidence database to inform those discussions. The advisors, there were about 15 of us. We had certainly physicians involved. We had payment experts. We had CPT coding experts. We had individuals from industry. And then we evolved and we got to the question that we, as we aggregate our evidence base, we proceeded to the question that we knew physicians were going to ask is that is, you know, will I get paid for this service? And we looked at coding, we looked at payment policy, we looked at pricing, we looked at some of the coverage policies, which we'll discuss shortly. We looked at liability and then we evolved that into um, sort of moving to the right of the screen is now can we address liability and we can address what's going to be discussed in this call is does it work in my practice? You know, what's the evidence base there to support that? And there's a few of our accomplishments there and many of the, the, the codes I'm gonna discuss and many, some of the policies I'm gonna to discuss today are in many ways a direct product of the actions of this group. But to be clear, they are very much the product of local innovation, local experience, translating into national policy. And those that have heard me speak before know how strongly I feel that 
we at the AMA, by definition, are a national organization, but our responsibility is to be responsive to the states and be responsive to the local practices and the physicians to inform policy and implement policy that allows those physicians to do what they do best. So what we're gonna do is I wanna walk through and we're gonna, I'm gonna base my comments largely on what we sort of generically think of as the revenue cycle. I'm gonna start with coding, we'll venture into payment and we'll venture into coverage. And to build on Dr. Libby's point, I mean, what we're seeing from a coverage perspective, I mean, none of us could have predicted how wide open this space has become. And I'm gonna walk through some of those coverage changes just so we have an understanding of how that relates to what we were experiencing previously. So let's start, and I, I wanna talk about coding. And for those of us that aren't necessarily in the coding space, when you hear the word coding, you think, oh great, here it comes. This is a bunch of five digit numerals and a bunch of long descriptors, and it's gonna be hard to follow. And, and to be fair, in the coding space, in, in some ways that's what it is. But I want us to take a step back, and I want us to think of coding more in the sense of nomenclature and more in the sense of how we can develop a standardized taxonomy. So frankly, we're as physicians talking in the same language with the same voice, but as we translate those codes in that nomenclature to things like payment policy, but equally important is research, epidemiology, disease tracking, health policy research. I mean, this is our language and this is what we have the ability through the AMA to inform. I and mean, we're the ones that go to the table and present these codes present the data that supports their existence and moves these forward. So we're gonna walk through, in the spirit of us speaking in a common language, we're gonna walk through what those codes are. I do wanna define a term because this is, as we talk about how we're gonna classify these individual codes related to telehealth, this is a differentiation that we found helpful and that's synchronous, which is essentially real-time two-way audio exchange, which is generally how telehealth has been covered. But there's also a significant interest in asynchronous, which is, store and forward technologies, to some degree remote patient monitoring. And I'm gonna kind of walk through, and this is, it's, it's a, this is a, a very dense slide, and I, by no means am I gonna go through this, but I wanted to share it just because it's an example of how we're kind of thinking about this at the AMA level to propose a taxonomy or a coding structure. And this isn't quite in the public domain, but I checked with the AMA and our coding experts, and they were completely supportive of me sharing this. I do have a version of this slide that has the individual CPT codes included, but I wanted to share it for reference because it's gonna guide the next few slides as I discuss kind of the general structure of this codes. And again, once we have that coding base and that coding nomenclature, we'll move on to other discussions on how those codes are applied to some of the questions and comments I've already heard during this session. So let's start to kind of the left of the screen, which is the patient physician visit. And let's walk through what some of those existing codes are. So when we talk about patient physicians or QHPs, which are qualified health professionals, you know, that's a term we use within the coding space to describe non-physicians that are providing direct, uh, direct patient care. So within the synchronous space, this is kind of what we have. We certainly have evaluation and management codes. Those are the office-based codes and some of the new and established codes themselves. In general, we use a modifier 95 to increase telehealth. I'm gonna talk about this within the context of COVID-19 shortly, but this is, the standard nomenclature initially. It was mentioned we have telephone or audio only codes to describe those services. And then we have some other ones which are virtual check-in codes. As we venture to asynchronous, we have some of these. We have online digital evaluation for both physicians and non-physicians, and even the virtual check-in code that could be applied for these type of patient-physician interactions. We also have physician-to-physician codes for telehealth related encounters. And these are essentially interprofessional consultations. These are the codes, these can be online. These could be via the internet, internet. This could be through one's EHR. And those are a little bit of both. They're both kind of synchronous and they can be a real time interface or they could be asynchronous where you're having an interface where questions is posed and answers responded and so on and so on as part of a broader conversation. Dr. Libby and some others have already mentioned remote patient monitoring. Before I talk about those codes, I wanna kind of take a step back as far as how some of the coding nomenclature is managed. So when we talk about, and this is payment policy in general, we have relative value units which determine payment. And there is a professional or work component, a work RVU if you will, and there is a technical component or what we refer to as a practice expense component to that total RVU. 
There's also a malpractice component, which has a different methodology. It's equally relevant, but the methodology is a bit different. I won't dig into that specifically, although I'm glad to answer questions if we have some regarding how those are determined. In some settings, particularly radiology, when these two are performed together, it's referred to as the global payment. So when we talk about these types of services, it's important to differentiate them, particularly within the context of remote patient monitoring, because we do have quite a few, quote, technical component only or practice expense only codes. So when we think about remote patient monitoring, there's kind of four sort of buckets, if you will, where these codes exist. There's set up an education, because you have to get the patient comfortable with the equipment. You have to introduce them to the equipment. This requires, in general, clinical staff, can involve physicians as well. Certainly the supplies, data collection, and then data analysis and interpretation, which generally goes into the physician QHP side. And here's some of those codes. We have general remote patient monitoring codes. These are generally technical component only, but you see the general, you see ambulatory blood glucose. There's some for cardiovascular telemetry. We have some supplies which are more general, and then we have the data collection. As we venture into the more professional component side, there's general interpretation, ambulatory blood glucose, which is interpreting the data, but also to some degree acting on the data, and then CV telemetry. To be fair, the rules regarding these codes are relatively granular and they're relatively specific. And they need to be considered within the context of when I'm seeing a patient for an evaluation and management service in my office via telehealth, and to be mindful of those rules. But we've really tried to be purposeful as, as we've created these codes to create them in a manner that is acceptable to payers who might be concerned about duplication of work or duplication of services, but also enable physicians and providers to use these codes in a meaningful manner for the types of financial analyses, which Meg alluded to and which others will probably discuss later this morning. I'm not gonna say a lot about payment, not that I don't think it's hugely important and in full disclosure, I'm actually a member of a group called the RBS Update Committee or the RUC. There's about 29 to 30 of us. We meet three times a year and we determine relativity of services. But I do wanna point out that if you Google physician fee schedule search, you can look up any of the codes that I've presented so far and you can break it down by your geographic domain and see what those payment amounts would be, at least from a Medicare perspective. Those Medicare physician fee schedules largely will translate into private payers to some degree, but that is a completely different set of databases that's contract determined, that is determined based on individuals within different institutions. And it's really hard to bring all of that data together but it, if you're just looking for some just very general guidance on what the payment amounts are, this is a really appropriate and important resource to pursue. Okay, so now let's venture into coverage. And to build on the point that I thought Dr. Libby made in, in, in a really important manner is, coverage has completely changed as a result of the disease. You know, what we saw from a coverage perspective pre-COVID, and to build on Dr. Libby's point, you know, what we literally fought for for years to accomplish, I mean, almost overnight has been completely turned around. And a lot of this was some of the initial executive orders that were signed by the president, but a lot of this is coming in some out of the CARES Act, but really the majority of this came out of the interim final rule, which is related to COVID, which was released um, earlier this week on Monday. And I'm gonna walk through those changes, understanding that what I'm describing is in place from at least a COVID perspective, during the emergency declaration, which you know, hopefully will end sooner than later, but it's during the period that that actually applies. So let's just kind of touch a little bit on the pre-COVID. You know, these were some of the challenges we were facing pre-COVID or originating site restrictions on where patients could be located, that they have to go to an office setting to have the telemedicine, to have the telemetry interface translated to a physician in his or her office. There were geographic limitations to where patients could be located, rural versus urban, restrictions on store and forward. You could lose it, use it in Alaska and Hawaii, but it was difficult to use elsewhere. What providers could provide it, even the services covered, as far as what we were able to provide from, a, from, from that perspective. You know, we tried several times, you know, the Connect Act of 2017 and 2019 are two examples where we've tried to get legislative relief to allow greater remote patient monitoring access, expanding some of the originating sites to some of that I've listed here, you know, clarification on how remuneration for these services 
And, and we made some gains. You know, they've been incremental gains, mostly through regulations as far as what's being covered. And, and, and to repeat the point, you know, this, the institutions, the physicians, the Dr. Libby's of the world, you know, they weren't waiting for this legislation and these regulations to catch up. They were pushing forward innovation because they saw it was necessary and they saw that it was the right thing to do. So we're playing a little bit of, or we were playing a little bit of catch up, but it's a responsibility that those of us in this space are taking extremely seriously. Okay, now let's talk post COVID and let's talk about what's happened based on, but what's based recently. In general, this is what we're seeing as far as how the new regulations are applied. As I mentioned, it is during the public health emergency declaration, which the president declared in early March. Essentially, all beneficiaries from a Medicare perspective are eligible, and that's new and established patients. You know, recall that prior there were several restrictions regarding telehealth for being required only for established patients that had a previously had a face-to-face -face office encounter. That is no longer the case. It's essentially wherever they are located or the provider are located. And you can imagine physicians at home talking to patients at home for all the reasons we've already described. And then, there's this, and then there's been guidance largely from the OIG that we can waive Medicare co-payments, um, deductibles, co-insurance, things of that sort. Before I talk about the evaluation and management services, because I think this is in many ways the largest piece and it gets to some of the questions asked about um, earlier already on this call. So when we talk about payment policy, I've already mentioned we talk professional component and technical component. But we also talk about facility versus non-facility. So the facility is if we're providing services in a hospital. Imagine we have a, a clinic, or in my case, I, I see some transplant patients at Michael, and we have a clinic that's basically part of the hospital. We build a facility setting. Now imagine conversely that we have a physician office separate from the hospital, maybe it's in a medical office building or a single standing facility or building office. That's the non-facility setting. And for payment reasons, those amounts are different. And we could talk all day about the implications of that from a site neutral budget neutrality perspective, but just understand that when we bill for our services, there may be differences in payment. In general, the office-based payments are higher, although that's not always the case and that requires a specific evaluation. So keep that point in mind as we talk about the evaluation management, because I'm going to make a point about how these should or could be built during this, um, during this setting that we're in. So when we talk about e &M services, and this was one of the first things that, this is part of the executive order very early in the crisis in early March, was it was expressed that CMS would pay for telehealth services at the same rate as face-to-face -face office visits. And this was an important, important change. The premise being exactly as Dr. Libby said, to work to keep patients from unnecessary exposure and traveling unnecessarily. This was for all diagnoses, not just COVID related. And when this is provided, and this is an important point, when these services are provided in the office setting, it is important we're recommending or we believe you should bill based on the place of service that is the office, which is POS code 11, applying the modifier 95, because that billing process will enable the higher non-facility payment rate. And that's where you're providing the service, so that's justified. If you bill that service with place of service two, which is telehealth, which would be otherwise objectively a very reasonable way to do it, the payment's based on the facility rate, which is generally lower in most Medicare jurisdictions. The code selection, this is another, this is another very important point. When we're billing the E and M codes, and it builds on some of the questions we've already heard about physical exams. And to be clear, as Dr. Libby said, there's means to provide physical exams by telemedicine and telehealth. There are applications. There, I mean, I, I talk to the vendors all the time about different applications and different technologies to allow, and it's not just remote patient monitoring, but to allow immediate monitoring of different physiologic parameters. So this technology is there. But if we look at the different, this, the e &M codes comparing as they currently exist versus e &M codes which have been revised in their structure, the coding numbers are the same, but the coding structure, the descriptors, and the billing documentation requirements have been updated. So going forward in 2021, when we bill an e and code, no longer is it 
present history of present illness, physical exam, medical decision making. Now the code selection going forward will be based on time or the complexity or level of medical decision making. Okay, those are 2021 requirements, but the interim final rule stated for the very reasons we've described that the code selection currently during the crisis will be based not on the physical exam, but time and medical decision making. So when we interface with the patient by telehealth during the crisis, even though technically you're not doing what we would think of as an in face-to-face -face physical exam, that doesn't and it shouldn't limit the codes that we provide. A couple of other points, physicians may provide telehealth services in their home without having to go through the Medicare uh, updates to their enrollment file. The licensure piece is, is pretty significant. You know, we've been on in several discussions regarding licensure and you have to understand, licensure from a constitutional perspective is the right of the states based on their constitutional responsibility to protect their citizens. Okay, that's great on paper, that's fine. But on a practical level, from a telehealth perspective, it, it can be burdensome, it can be restricting. So during the crisis, physicians licensed in one state may provide services in another state because that's the right thing to do in a crisis. Now state laws do apply, so it's not a complete free pass, but it is relevant for our discussions. And then lastly, as far as medical screening exams, which are a requirement under EMTALA, before those were acquired face-to-face, -face, those can now be provided by telehealth. There's some substance abuse related aspects just to help and minimize those that are facing this disorder to receive the evaluations and allowing physicians to treat those patients appropriately. Some technology considerations, we've kind of touched on a couple of those, Dr. Libby did, but just to kind of bring those together. Essentially, any audio two-way interface will do. And, and the ones that we're seeing commonly described are FaceTime, Skype, and Zoom. Importantly, this does not allow us to use Facebook Live, Twitch, TikTok, any interface that would otherwise allow a public facing component to it, which, which kind of makes sense. You know, you know, these are still very personal interactions we're having between the physician and the patient and they don't want to be live. Um, I will make a quick comment if I may, and this is some experience we're having locally, but what I'm hearing nationally is, there are some centers where, you know, I think Dr. Libby is a good example, some centers where they're set up with their EHR, they're set up for the audiovisual two-way communication, but there are many centers where that's just not the case. And it's particularly, it's not just the patient side, it's the physician side as well. And it's not across one age group versus another, it's across all age groups. So what we're seeing is in the setting of a crisis where we're learning a new technology, where we're being called to the forefront to provide these services, we're falling back in many ways on the telephone. And I think that's a completely appropriate. You know, patients in a time of crisis that aren't familiar with these types of interfaces would much rather just pick up the phone and talk to their physician. And we'll talk in a moment about what the payment considerations are regarding the telephone, but that's something that I've already heard on this call and that I will tell you that we're hearing most unquestionably nationally. As far as some other rules, so the um, Office of Civil Rights, the OCR has come out and said that they're gonna allow an enforcement discretion on security and HIPAA payments and business associate agreements. Um, I will say there are a few applications for this types of telehealth health interfaces that we think are gonna comply with the BAA requirements. And some of these are UpDocs and Zoom for Healthcare, G Suite, Google G Suite, um, Hangouts, et cetera. I haven't seen this in paper as guidance from the ONC or the OIG or the OCR, um, but I, understand from discussions that this is forthcoming. If others have seen that, please share, because I think it's important. And then lastly, as far as the potential security risk, it probably is a responsible thing for physicians to at least let patients know in a manner that doesn't jeopardize their confidence in that interaction, but does allow us to at least communicate that this is a different paradigm for both of us, patient and physician included. This is a really big deal. The expanded list of services is, complete, is, is completely different than what we saw before. I mean, now it's not just office-based. I mean, it's everything before you I'm listing here. And there's more. It's neonatal, it's physical therapy, it's radiation treatment management, it's social workers. I mean, it's, it's really almost everything that we probably, if we had the collective desire to do and we wanted to achieve what I'm showing on this slide would probably take us years of effort that we just saw completely change overnight albeit temporarily, but it changed overnight. And I'm just gonna take this opportunity to make this comment. 
we're going to find ourselves six months from now, a year from now, looking back on this period from a historical perspective. And I think you know, now's the time for us to respond to the crisis, to do what physicians do to save lives. But we want to be sure that, that we learn from this experience and that we show that this technology is ready for prime time and that we maintain the quality. Because if CMS, I said this on the call yesterday with, um, with the White House, is if CMS is allowing laxity to the requirements and the expectations of physicians in the short term, it is incumbent on physicians to assume that responsibility, take it seriously and prove that we're, we're allowing it. And I'm not for a second implying that we're not. I'm just telling my physicians locally that you know, even though you're sitting at home interfacing with the patient, you know, step up and take that interaction seriously. Provide the documentation as necessary you know, and put yourself you know, into that kind of work zone, if you will, during those interactions. And without question, physicians are stepping up and it's really a pleasure to see. There's a few other aspects. There's coverage now for virtual check-ins. And recall, this was for established patients. Well, now it's new and established patients. The expanded providers that we're seeing for these e-visits with some of the codes I've provided here are included before you. The telephonic codes. So one of the things we heard on the call yesterday that, that I want to highlight is from a payment perspective, the e &M codes pay more than the telephonic codes. And we can walk through, if we have time, how that happened at the RUC. I was involved in some of those discussions. But just suffice it to say that we're hearing from physicians in the community that they would, what they would like to be able to do is providing evaluation management service over the telephone for the reasons I described and bill it as an e &M, as opposed to the three codes or the six codes I'm showing before you now, which are telephonic specific codes, which are covered, but the payment amount is less. And I think CMS is hearing this. I can't promise they're gonna make that update, but Seema Verma, the CMS administrator yesterday on the call made the point several times that they are hearing this feedback. And to be frank, it's coming from physicians that are financially stressed based on the circumstances for a number of reasons, which are completely appropriate and completely understandable for them to express. Remote patient monitoring, a couple of updates there. It can now be applied to both new and established patients. It's acute and chronic conditions. And instead of being multiple diseases, some of the codes require two, three diseases to be uh, included as far as chronic management of patients. It can be only one disease. And for my coding folks on the call, I did go ahead and include those, the, the CPT codes before you. Some frequency limitation changes. I won't read through these, but understand some of the requirements for how many visits had to occur within certain time frames have been loosened up. Then there's some others regarding ESRD patients national determinations and local that require face-to-face -face, that is now waived on some services. The beneficiary consent, it's not required that we do that before the service. We can do it at the same time of the service. But again, it's not necessarily something that we have to hamper that interaction with. And there's some requirements around nursing homes. Quick point, if I may, regarding the consent. You know, we're hearing about experiences and, and the experience I heard from, from Ohio yesterday where the numbers, round numbers, where before COVID, they had 47 providers and they had provided, you know, five, 600 e-health visits that we're discussing today. Since the COVID crisis has occurred, they now have a thousand different providers, mostly physicians, and they've provided over 10,000 telehealth visits in six weeks. I mean, the numbers, the numbers are staggering. But what that means is, we're seeing physicians entering the telehealth space that haven't done so before, just by pure circumstance. And one of the things that we're telling CMS at the AMA level, and we're thanking CMS is that they're loosening these security requirements and loosening the HIPAA requirements because you don't want these physicians who are in good faith entering these types of interactions, worrying that the OIG is looking over their shoulder or that their medical license could be threatened or they could have some liability consequences. I think it's a really important point for those of us on this call to communicate in our discussions, which we're having at the federal level, but clearly and unquestionably at the state and the local level, and with private payers, by the way. Okay, so let's kind of venture now and talk a little bit about, that was pretty much the majority of my talk. I'm gonna kind of bring it together to a couple of points, which are gonna be relevant to our discussion today. You know, what are we seeing at the state and what are we seeing with the non-government payers? 
um, a little bit about what we're seeing in, in the state of Texas and anyone from the TMA, please, after my talk, feel free to add to this or correct any comments that I make. And in fact, anything that I've said before this, you know, anyone in this group, if there's something I misstated or I need to research further, you know, we're very much learning on the fly in a crisis mode. So I'm really trying to do my best to present what's accurate, but I do fully recognize and appreciate that, that, that some of this may need to be, you know, revisited or discussed. That said, let's talk about what we're seeing in Texas. So we're seeing Texas, the, the governor of Texas, uh, Greg Abbott has come out and said that the state regulated plans are eligible for payment for medical visits conducted over the phone at the same rate as the in-person visits. Okay, recognize for a moment that I just said that at the federal level, what I just described does not apply. In other words, the telephone visits are being paid on a different fee schedule. And why that's relevant is this is, you know, we're sort of managing a little bit of a dance here between what the federal government is allowing and what the states are allowing, where the states may be a little bit, a little bit more liberal in what they're allowing us to offer. And we don't want to jeopardize what's happening at the state level with federal policy, but we want to kind of pursue this goal where there's at least some continuity uh, across the payers and across policies. Um, this does include Medicaid within the state of Texas. And in general, we're seeing the private payers following. But again, that's a very heterogeneous landscape. And I'm sure the experience in Florida and Massachusetts is similar. So let's talk about what we do in this scenario. You know, oops, I'm not getting paid. You know, we had this great meeting on Saturday morning. We brought all this information together. And now this is my circumstance. Just a few examples. Let's, this is a little bit of what we have in Texas. We do have a hassle log factor. There's the website where... Our physicians can log in, they can document sort of what their experience was. This is generally at the private payer level. And we periodically meet with the different medical directors for, you know, the big insurance carriers, the Aetna, the Sigma, the Blue Cross in our state. And it gives us a chance to objectively share what those experiences are and potentially try to find some relief for our physicians. Um, we did ask the question in Massachusetts, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm hesitant to speak for the state because I think you're going to have a chance to speak for your experience, but this is just some of what was communicated. This Physician Resource Center, there's an email to communicate exactly the same types of experiences. And I really appreciated what we heard from Florida because I think Florida really captures what is at a higher level, really what we do at the state medical association level and what we largely do at the institutional level, which is this is we listen to and we work with local practices. We listen to the, we interface with the payers. We interface with the regulatory agencies. We engage our coders, we engage their coders. You know, we have legal looking at the different policies that are in place and we make informed discussions. I mean, this is the core of what we do and what we have the resources to provide, again, at the state level, at the federal level. And I'll just take one quick moment to repeat the point is, what we do at the AMA level, at the national level, and this is certainly, at the House of Delegates, and let's be fair, I mean, it's what we do at that, in that room. But in many ways, it's those interactions we have with the you know, state medical associations to learn what those experiences are, where others are experiencing that at the state level, and what we can do at the federal level to provide relief. And it's, you know, we have some extremely talented, many, many of whom are on this call today, but extremely talented staff at the AMA level, you know, that dedicate their careers and dedicate themselves to working for physicians in this regard. I'm gonna close with my last slide. I mentioned the Digital Medicine Payment Advisory Group at the beginning, and this is kind of where we are, and this was a pre-COVID slide. I, I, I don't have a great sense of where we're going to be immediately after this crisis resolves, but you know, I've already talked about the taxonomy we were creating. We're looking at how we're gonna define things like face-to-face -face within the coding set. We're looking at metrics to evaluate, engage the efficiency of the type of digital medicine interfaces we're discussing. You know, we're digging very aggressively into augmented intelligence and trying to find ways to, in the same way that we're standardizing the taxonomy for digital health and telehealth, you know, standardizing the tech, not taxonomy for augmented intelligence. You know, what is supervised learning versus unsupervised learning? You know, what is a locked system versus a continuously learning system? And we're engaging data scientists from across the country to inform that, again, under the premise that this is happening already. The vendors are driving this. If you look at the 80,000 patents that have been filed for augmented intelligence, you know, a third of those are in healthcare over the last six years. I mean, this is a very rapidly evolving space, and it's the AMAs and it's our, our premise and our continued assertion 
that the physicians need to be involved in informing these discussions, and we are. And then we're looking from the advocacy side. I mean, some of what I'm descri describing here was stuff we were fighting for late last year, which has already been, I mean, has already been relieved, if you will, from the COVID. And then lastly, you know, we, I think we do have a responsibility, and I think Dr. Libby touched on it, to really look at what the evidence is for what we are doing. The data, the effect, effectiveness from a clinical side, what the provider's experience is, justification for coverage expansion, and in, in the numbers that we're seeing in the COVID crisis, I mean, are a... I mean, they are literally a laboratory to inform these discussions. We're gonna to have to be responsible and purposeful once we survive this crisis collectively to take the steps to inform how the telehealth space is gonna evolve going forward. Um, with that said, I wanna thank Shannon and the TMA team for including me, the AMA staff, and everyone that took the time to listen to my comments. Um, thank you again, and I'll be on for the duration if there are other questions. Shannon, I think I can stop the share on the screen and um, send it back to you, thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Silva. Excellent information. Meg, I noticed quite a few questions coming mm -hmm. from the chat function, if you'd like to start with those. And while we do that, I, I just want to state that while we do this Q&A, if you need a quick bio break, by all means, we understand if you need to step away for a minute, but um, otherwise we'll continue with questions and discussion. Go ahead, Meg. Great. Yeah, and thanks everyone for um, chiming in and responding as you see fit to, to the chat here. Um, the first question that I think has gone unanswered, though, is um, from Kulang in Florida, and we've heard insurance will decrease payment if we put in a modifier. How do we handle them? Um, Dr. Silva, do you want to take that first? Yeah, no, it's, it's, an, important, it's an important point. It kind of gets into that facility, non-facility discussion where you know, we're recommending the place of service for the office when that applies with, with the 95 modifier to indicate the service. There is, as you know, a, a telehealth modifier, which is O2, which could be applied to the code as the place of service. But I think in, you know, we want to look at those fee schedules because I, I speak with confidence about the evaluation and management piece, but there may be differences in some of the other codes we described, some of the wellness visits and some of the critical care and other services you might see in our community where we're going to want to look at those uh, more specifically to ensure those amounts. And I, I predict this is probably guidance that, that we're working on at the AMA level as far as some coding scenarios. You know, I didn't talk about diagnosis coding. I didn't talk specifically about some of the other policies and how we indicate, you know, lab services and how we indicate those types of consultative services. But it all kind of fits into the same question, which is an important one. Thank you. Great. The next question was from um, Amy and said, any update on CMS reimbursement for codes 99441? Uh, dash three. To my knowledge, those fees have not been published yet. Yeah, it's 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 an it's an important question. So those actually codes do have those did go through the RUC process and they do have valuation. So for others, those are basically the telephonic codes, and the way they're structured is is they're based on time. So if, I think the first code is five to ten minutes of telephone time, and it goes incrementally up from there. So the AMA and the RUC we have shared with CMS our recommendations, and that's based on surveys of physicians. It's what we do at the Rock to Value Services. CMS has those, as, as you've correctly stated, those are not covered services in the pre-COVID world. So CMS is gonna to have to provide those updates, um, and, and we anticipate that if it already hasn't happened, anticipate that shortly. And it is an important question, thank you. Yeah. Then there was a, a number of questions um, from MMS and uh, Chris, I'll do my best to, to summarize here, but um, a lot of it related to, you know, physicals and um, doing adult and well child visits and, you know, understand that a lot of that can be done by telehealth, but the key question around, you know, can enough of a visit be done to that we meet the criteria set out by codes 99391-6 and can we do enough of a physical to check enough boxes so that we meet the requirements. Um, is really the the summarized version. Yeah, yeah, this is, a, I mean, I think Dr. Libby's answer earlier, I thought maybe I'll defer to him shortly, but just from a pure coding perspective, and, and I'm going to look at my database while Dr. Libby's speaking, but is, yeah, the, the, those are codes that, to my knowledge, CMS hasn't specifically come out and said that the, the physical exam is waived in the same way that the evaluation and management codes. So when we look at the sort of larger family V&M codes, the only family that's specifically gone through the revisions I've described for 2021 is the office-based codes, which are new and established codes, which I showed. It's logical to think that the other codes, for example, these codes themselves, or imagine 
ICU visits and codes of that sort, because the coding structure, we might want that to be parallel between the two, that there may be a revision, but that hasn't happened yet. So I think, I think it's, it's an important question because if that physical exam face-to-face, -face, you know, hands-on is required, it, it is troublesome to be able to build those codes. But again, this is the kind of question that we can take back to CMS, back to the policymakers, and encourage that they allow some physician relief if we describe, determine that's appropriate. Um, Dr. Libby? Yeah, it's sort of the, like the Wild West right now. <clears throat> I think that um, nobody's going to be uh, scrutinizing how you care for your patients as long as the outcomes are appropriate for the situation. I think for those of us who are established in practice and have those patient-physician relationships, uh, they aren't going to be scrutinized in any way that's going to put your coding in jeopardy. Uh, what we experience will be what we observe over the next uh, few weeks and months uh, to see how the payers reimburse uh, based upon the coding that you use uh, to devise and develop the parameters around which you will qualify what your visit was worth. <clears throat> I mean, these are things that, that there is no established uh, baseline from which to to derive an answer easily anyway. So I, I think that we will define, this is something that we have to lead and I really appreciate uh, Zeke's presentation. I think it was really comprehensive and very, very, uh, uh, let's say, uh, visionary in terms of how this is going to unfold. I think we have to establish the database. We have to be able to interpret how it is applied and we have to be part of that uh, that guidance that that does give CMS and the payers the insights they know they need to be able to make this work. Yeah, Dr. Libby, thank you. This is Zeke. So if I if I, I build on those comments, so while Dr. Libby was talking, I actually looked in the database at those codes, the nine nine three nine one three three, and and to the point of the question, the physical exam is required, and it's it's weight, length, head circumference, it's things that that pediatricians appropriately do with every one of their patients. I don't have an answer to if that's gonna be weighed from a telehealth perspective. To Dr. Libby's point, I think if we do our best and we document as best as we can, the fact that we're keeping patients protected from unnecessary exposures, I think justifies the action. But, but after the call, I mean, I would welcome, you know, emailing, you know, Meg Stacy or any of the AMA staff with that question and that mm -hmm. potential need. And I'm pretty confident that that would probably be something that would be pretty easily kicked up to the federal level. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Dr. Silva. You know, anything that is currently, you know, a little murky or unanswered, we can definitely take back and make sure we're raising that to the right folks internally. Um, the next question was from Sujath um, around, is palliative service covered under telehealth? Yeah, this, 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 this is Zeke Silva. I don't, I'd have to look more specifically in our final rule. I don't have off the top of my head um, maybe while other questions are coming up, I can do a little bit of research and see if I can answer that question. Sure. And Dr. Silva, on one of your slides, there was a question regarding, um, you had domicile um, specified versus home. Is there any differentiation there or is that one in the same? Uh, I'm sorry, you broke up real quickly there. Ask me that question again, Megan. Um, on one of the slides, uh, domicile was listed uh, versus home visits, and we were curious if there's any differentiation there. Well, th there is from a coding perspective. There are different mm -hmm. CPT codes for each one of those settings. I, you know, I don't use those in my practice, so I defer to others as far as the nature of the requirements. And um, but yeah, there are different CPT codes, which is why I indicated those specifically. And that's enough, we, we can dig into those and see if there's mm -hmm. requirements that we may need to loosen. Great. All right, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Um, Okay, Dr. Silva, when speaking about TMA hassle-free log, you briefly mentioned that Florida made some positive advances. Can you elaborate, please? Well, I mean, I, mean, I, would, I would defer to Florida on, on that, but I guess my point with the Florida was that I think what they're describing is what we're all essentially doing ourselves, which is building relationships, you know, ensuring that we have a discussion forum with the private payers so that when we see policies affecting physicians at the individual practice level or the institutional level, that we can kick those up pretty quickly. But, you know, I defer to Florida regarding what their direct experience is. Maybe we'll have time later in the call to share some of those ideas. Mm -hmm. 
Matt, anything um, your team wants to jump in for that yeah. one? Yeah, I think you pretty well. I'm going to let Jared take over because that's kind of Jared's uh, forte. Right. Yeah, absolutely. What Dr. Silva says is correct. I mean, we just do our best to work with our members and, uh, you know, keep everybody up to date. We work directly in contact and, uh, you know, contact the payers in our state regularly. And we do have a certified coder on our staff as well as uh, two staff attorneys who I uh, work with on any legal issues surrounding telemedicine. But uh, the bottom line is, you know, in Florida, one, uh, as far as the way our laws are working, you know, we don't have a uniform uh, payer requirement under Florida. I've asked our insurance uh, Commissioner, in this time of crisis, to uh, effectively require all payers to reimburse for telehealth services at uh, within uh, person visits. But uh, currently, um, there is a variation across the board in terms of what private payers in the state of Florida will pay for. And addressing that has been our, our biggest obstacle, but we are doing our best to educate our members. And uh, we have a, a robust uh, payment advocacy service for our members. So, uh, from that perspective, um, you know, we're continuing to do uh, sort of the, the same sort of work that, that, that you mentioned. Uh, sir, and uh, in, in any case, uh, you know, again, uh, just uh, trying to get the private payers on board, uh, preferably uh, through our insurance commissioner is really our, uh, I think, our number one objective at the state advocacy level at the moment, telehealth-wise. Thank you. Great. Um, Shannon, how are we on time? Can I keep going with a few more, or? I would say we probably need to, to move on to the next section, but we um, hold your questions because we will have some time for open discussion at the end. But for sake of time, maybe we should go on to the next section. Um, and thanks, everybody, for the great questions and great discussion. Really important. Um, so this next section, I'll go ahead and pass over to Stacy to get started. Stacy. And one quick thing to note, this is Meg before Stacy gets started. Um, Dr. Silva and others, you know, for those questions that are in the chat, if you do have a second to just look through some and can respond to any via chat, that would be great as well. So thank you. And Shannon, do you have the deck? Were you planning to use that um, now or did you had you had a combined copy or do you want me to pull it up? Sorry about that. Yes, I'm pulling the deck up now, Stacy. Also, while you're doing that, Shannon, I put in the chat that if there's so much good information and back and forth conversation in it. it you are able to save the chat so that mm -hmm. after this call, it does not go away. So yeah. if you want to scroll up, I, I put in there how to do that. Awesome. Are you seeing the screen now with the PowerPoint? Stacey? Yep, that's perfect. Um, and thank you, Dr. Libby and Dr. Silva for those amazing talks and all the discussion. I think this is immensely helpful. Um, for everyone today. Even myself, I feel like I try to keep up with all the changes going on, but it feels like there's just something new uh, every day. Um, so myself and then Shannon and Yvonne from TMA are going to talk uh, for the better part of the next hour um, to about kind of getting into the nuts and bolts around how we make telehealth work in practice. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to briefly mention um, you've heard me talk about the digital health implementation playbook a couple of times. We launched our first playbook in the series uh, focused on remote patient monitoring, and we're really excited um, to announce that we've uh, officially completed the, the playbook that is focused completely on telehealth. And um, we, I was going to bring it up today, but for the sake of time, just thought I would mention it. You'll get a little bit of a teaser uh, as I go through a couple of my slides here. Um, but we do want uh, to be, we will be sending this out um, to this group uh, immediately following um, the session today, uh, getting, giving you all kind of a sneak peek. You'll be the first one to see it in, in its entirety, um, but figured it would be very useful for this group to get as soon as possible. Uh, we do ask that this not be shared quite yet beyond this group. Uh, it will be uh, it, making its formal debut. Uh, publicly early next week. So we'll be sure to share the web page and the downloads um, as, as soon as possible after that. But we will give you a hard copy or PDF copy. And then as soon as things open back up, uh, the plan is to send kind of a nice uh, book copy of this um, as well. So again, over the, over the next hour, we're going to review some general considerations for designing your workflow and setting up telehealth in practice, including some specific policy roles and responsibilities um, across the practice and care teams, and then um, additional, you know, some state-based resources as well. And then we're also 
um, excited to have a few um, folks from different practices that are participating in the initiative to share some of their uh, initial experiences implementing telehealth um, since many of you have already gotten started. So we already have some kind of best practices to share um, from those participating in the group. All right, and I'll also note, um, this information may not be as specific to the COVID situation, um, but still very relevant to what's going on today. Um, we recognize, you know, things are happening at a really rapid speed, um, as we heard from both Dr. Libby and Dr. Silva. Um, but I think, you know, we're really, it, it's also really important and um, really worth considering how we move forward with implementing telehealth now, but also later and into the future as well, and doing that in a thoughtful way um, to protect our patients, our practice, be able to tell quality stories, hopefully as well, to continue with some of the, the coverage that we're seeing in this emergency situation. So to get started, we suggest you know, during this kind of step of designing your workflow, um, set some goals to accomplish. And in our research um, and talking to many physicians, um, members of the care team, even patients, um, how that the workflow has impacted them, you know, we've really identified some key goals uh, to kind of set uh, early on in the process of, of the work, designing the workflow, um, to help guide along the way. So we've kind of summarized a, a few of those. Um, getting input from both um, your, your care team members, others in your practice that are going to be um, supporting the telehealth program and visits, as well as some of the patients, um, would be really helpful as you start to think about what um, this means for your, your practice. So what are some of the physicians or the other clinicians that may be doing um, telehealth visits? What are some of their initial um, concerns or apprehensions? What are some of their preferences related to scheduling and things like that? Um, and then also, do you know what times of the day are, are sometimes preferred by patients, right? So Dr. Luby talked about some after hours and things like that. So um, the, it's helpful to really kind of understand what you need from a, a clinician standpoint, but also what your patients will be looking for um, to help make this successful. Um, and to take the time to taking the time to document what your current workflow looks like and where that may differ um, in a telehealth visit is also really important. So then you can kind of start to map out um, what's needed from different care team members, how they need to, need to be trained, um, who needs to be trained, and considering things um, like scheduling and how medical assistants or nurses may interface with telehealth visits. Um, how the front desk may check in or check out patients uh, for a telehealth visit. Um, clearly defining protocols for when a telehealth visit is appropriate. Um, so how will this be incorporated into the scheduling flow? Is there a list of questions that your scheduler will ask patients when they call the office to kind of determine if, if they're appropriate for a telehealth visit or not? Um, or is this something that is you know, out on your website or in your patient portal? that patients can kind of um, self-assess and would direct them to, to a telehealth visit. So just kind of identifying those protocols to be able to plug into uh, the system or have for your schedulers early on is, is important. Um, realizing today, obviously, in the situation that we're in now, um, probably a lot more circumstances warrant a telehealth visit now than they would have maybe a, a month ago. Um, You'll want to set up appropriate space in the clinic. Um, so uh, again, I know many of these, these telehealth visits are happening from physician homes today, but um, when, when you are in the clinic space, um, where will these, these visits be conducted? Is lighting good? Do you need any special equipment to be prepared in that room? Do you need dual screens, things like that. So really just kind of setting your, your space up for success too. And then a plan for scheduling, documenting, and billing for the visit. So um, when will telehealth visits be available and how will you indicate those as time slots on the schedule so that the schedulers know when they can schedule telehealth visits. Um, we've heard that it works uh, for some folks as intermixed with other in-person visits and then other physicians and clinicians have preferred to kind of have a block of time um, dedicated to virtual visits. So, it seems to just depend on preference and how it works in your practice and what's best. Um, what needs to be documented? So 
um, consent no, um, notion of the virtual visit, things like that. Um, could these be created as new templates uh, in your EHR so that it automatically pulls up kind of the, the inputs that you need to account for when you're doing a telehealth visit um, and getting those set up in your EHR ahead of time. And then finally, um, ensuring that you know the right codes for telehealth visits and that those are actually um, integrated into your EHR and are able to be um, coded and billed as appropriate um, in the visit. So those are some kind of general um, considerations that we've created, but we've also broken down even further um, some key considerations uh, for the pre-visit, the day of and during the visit and post-visit from, you know, real uh, patient specific, I think, perspective, I would call it. Shannon, one, one step back is fine, thanks. <laughs> Not quite there yet. So pre-visit, um, things like setting up triage protocols like we already discussed to identify patients um, that are, are appropriate for telehealth visit, again, probably more of a past state or future state um, given the current environment. Um, prepare and be able to distribute education materials on how to have a telehealth visit. So um, one of the resources that we've created in the playbook is kind of like a patient facing, here's what to expect, here's how to prepare for your telehealth visit. So really helping them uh, be successful in their own homes or wherever they are taking that visit. Um, how to communicate with patients, um, for example, visit reminders, uh, how do you prompt them to initiate the visit through the platform, things like that. And then how will you check for insurance coverage for telehealth visits um, and, or, and or communicate any uh, payment expectations to patients ahead of the visit. And then day of enduring. Um, this is kind of really the, the key pieces of getting your care team involved and who else will potentially be participating as a part of that televisit at any one point in time. So how do patients check in? Um, how will you collect any payments or necessary co-pays? Um, that could be, I know some uh, platforms and vendors uh, help to facilitate that, but it could, could that also be done through your patient portal? Um, or any online kind of payment system that exists in your practice today. How are they kind of virtually roomed um, so that they're kind of in the space ready to uh, be seen by the physician or the clinician? How will you consent, uh, get the consent? Is that verbal and documented? Do you have an electronic form um, that they're able to kind of electronically sign? Um, and then what does that handoff look like? Um, pre-physician visit and even post-physician visit. So what does the, what can the MA or the nurse potentially do uh, before the physician is ready? Um, and then after, if they need to communicate any next steps from a um, ordering perspective, if they are ordering prescriptions or things like that, if they need to schedule a follow-up time um, to come back, or is that via telehealth, is that in person? So kind of who's going to communicate that, or is that going to be the physician or the clinician that's taking the visit? Um, and then some kind of post-visit considerations that we've mapped out. Um, some of the documentation may happen post-visit, um, some may not. So just kind of uh, wrapping up that documentation. How will any feedback be collected from the patient? Um, many vendors we've also heard allow for kind of like a quick two or three question, you know, questionnaire post visit that the patient can kind of share what their experience was like very quickly and that can help practices adjust uh, in the future. And then ensure the bill goes out with correct coding. Um, and then continuing to kind of track some of those reimbursements to make sure that if you are getting any denials or things like that, kind of troubleshooting that so that um, can be uh, fixed for future visits and, and continue to collect bill correctly and collect um, the reimbursement. Next slide, please. So I've pulled out a sample workflow um, ch uh, from Children's Hospital of Los Angeles. Uh, they shared this with us during our research for the playbook. Um, this is an established patient scheduling their first telehealth visit and just kind of lays out the flow of the scheduling process. Um, so you can see uh, then to it lays out what happens the day of or during the visit really lays out who's responsible for each piece of this workflow. Um, of course, this will vary uh, based on your practice staffing model, um, but I think this could be a very helpful guide as you start to kind of map out your own workflows and who's responsible for what um, 
pre, post, and, and during uh, these visits. And I also believe Shannon and Yvonne will be taking a little bit more, talking in a little bit more detail uh, about these roles and responsibilities across the practice as well. Next slide, please. We've also created a telehealth visit etiquette checklist. Um, and uh, we've put this together again, based on what we've heard from physicians and care team members that we talked to um, from across the country during our research to create this, this playbook. And it covers considerations around environment, equipment, how to dress, um, communication tips for the visit. Um, we know technology is providing you know, a really great option uh, or seeing patients in a new way, but it definitely does have its unique needs to ensure that the, the visit is successful. Um, so this is kind of the, the, the clinician side of, of the visit checklist and some key tips to consider. And again, we've also uh, created something similar for, that would be patient facing and, and educational in nature for them as well. Next slide, please. Um, so, it's also really important to plan how you'll tell patients and the community about your telehealth offerings and really should be uh, considered ASAP in this process, especially now. Uh, it will drive use and it lets patients know that they can see their own physician via telehealth instead of um, potentially leveraging some of the direct to consumer options that often interrupt that continuity of care which is a big reason you know, we even you know, wanted to do the telehealth initiative in the first place. It's really to help um, continue that continuity of care and allow patients to see you as their regular physicians in different ways. I wanted to specifically actually bring this up today because we've received quite a few inquiries and questions from physicians asking whether or not they're allowed to promote their telehealth offerings because they had heard that um, these visits need to be patient initiated. Um, so for clarity, we just kind of wanted to, to make sure that we let you know that there was no rule kind of prohibiting that proactive telling of patients about the telehealth offerings that you are, are now, that are now available to them in your practice. So we definitely encourage um, doing patient outreach, sharing communications on your patient portals and practice newsletters, kind of wherever you might advertise your practice. Um, that will only help kind of let your current patients know uh, that this is an option to them as well as potential new patients too. And we do have some language in uh, the resources section again of the playbook um, that practices can take and leverage for your own environment. Um, but you know, really initial uh, promotion can be as simple as just kind of an overview of the offering, what telehealth is, and maybe you know, some key pieces of, of information around what uh, might be appropriate for a telehealth visit. So uh, again, really just wanted to kind of reiterate that this is definitely um, something that you can do as a physician in a practice um, and let your patients know that this is available to them moving forward. And then next slide, please. Um, so there are some steps um, in the playbook between setting up your workflow and implementing, um, but given that many of you today participating are, you know, on an expedited schedule and um, are probably in the midst of implementing, I just kind of wanted to touch on, on a few key aspects that we have um, in that particular step too and that we think are really important. Um, so. I'm sure you know everyone has encountered in the last few weeks, especially whether it's via the visits, the televisits you're already doing, or just um, having virtual meetings with with folks that you know. Um, technology can certainly have glitches, um, and it's you know important to plan for these as much as possible. So, you know, one of our suggestions has been to just kind of allow for some of that extra time in your schedule to kind of troubleshoot those both either on your end or even the patient's end. Um, maybe at the beginning of that visit so that you don't kind of run behind, but you're really kind of baking that into um, your schedule for the day. Um, we also, um, well, a few folks did this that we had talked to um, throughout the, the research process, but the idea of having these kind of quality checks on, on how telehealth visits are going um, seemed to be really important and also kind of helped uncover kind of um, key issues or challenges that people were having and really troubleshoot those and just 
also was a way to ensure the quality of the visit was happening, much like Dr. Silva said, kind of, you know, while um, there's a lot of expansions and, and restrictions being lifted, we still want to make sure that we're providing quality visits to, to, to patients uh, through this mode of, of the visit. So um, we kind of have, uh, have heard that doing quality checks as a team, um, so if you have multiple colleagues or staff members or physicians and clinicians that are participating in this kind of once a week or every other week now, kind of checking in, you know, um, almost like a, a, a rounds, grand rounds type of thing, talk about what's going well, what's not, maybe um, pick a visit that went exceptionally well and maybe one that didn't go so well and, and try to use those as ways to kind of troubleshoot and uh, make sure that, you know, the telehealth program that is providing the quality uh, of patient care and things like that that you need. And then um, the last key kind of piece here is to track some of the metrics that you and your practice would consider measures of success. Um, your measure may look a little bit different now um, than it, it was uh, would have been pre-COVID, but I think we all recognize the impact of telehealth um, and, and how it can be a really positive experience for both patients and physicians. Um, you all signed up to participate in this even pre-COVID, so uh, it, there is that commitment there. But I think it will be more important than ever um, now that we have this group had already having it already established to really um, surface the success stories that come from this, surface the positive um, outcomes and data that come from this. Um, much like Dr. Silva and Dr. Libby have said, you know, to really kind of be able to tell that story of the impact telehealth can have for the future, so that you know when we do get past this time when we return to that normal normal space. Hopefully, we can keep many of these coverage expansions and things like that in place to continue to provide these services to patients as well. So I will stop there and transition over to TMA, um, and then I'm sure we'll be taking some questions after. All right. Thank you, Stacy. Excellent information. I did want to go back and share just a few slides on some data that TMA has collected um, we did a survey in January, and this was pre-COVID, of telemedicine use, and I thought you would be interested to see some of the results um, about how physicians are using telehealth. Now, mind you, this was just in January, so how telemedicine is being used, how it's anticipated to be used in five years, <laughs> which I think just a couple of months later, we are seeing some of those numbers, which I'll show you in a second. And then what are the barriers and the top two being the technology hassles and the no or low payment. So we're seeing a lot of that addressed right now. Um, and then as you may, well, it, at least in Texas, it is required that if you have a direct to consumer telemedicine visit, that the primary care physician should receive the follow up documentation of that visit. And we're seeing that only about 15% are seeing that documentation. Now I want to show you, um, and this is just really hot off the press, and this information, um, we did a survey this week. We've had over 3,500 physicians respond to it with a 9.5% response rate, and we asked them about telemedicine, but one of the first questions was operational challenges um, for physicians, and one was um, identifying telemedicine as far as getting started problems and even payment problems, 44% said that was an operational challenge. And then we see as far as plan to currently offer telemedicine at the practice, 56% said yes, regardless of compensation. That shows the compassionate care that, that physicians provide, that, we, that physicians know it's time to step up and then 23% said yes, if compensated appropriately, with high recognition of the viability of their practice that physicians should be paid for the work that they do. 12% saying no, 7% still weren't sure. And then I thought question seven was interesting, needing assistance getting started with telemedicine. 70% said no, they're already are jumping in and doing it. 20% said yes, and then uh, another 10% not, uh, did not know. 
and then reason for not offering. And this would be of only those that said no. So that would be the 12% here, of the 12% the, of the that said they were not going to do it. And 56% of those said they don't have the capable technology um, or that the patients do not. So I just wanted to share that data with you as far as where we are with telemedicine. Um, we have seen that a lot of times when we have um, surveys and such of our Texas physicians that the numbers typically uh, trend at the national level. So um, I did think that was interesting. I wanted to transition now uh, to just showing you some things that we do have on the, the TMA website. And this information we have fully available, full access for all physicians, for anybody, anywhere. Um, and we have been filling this out um, quite robustly over the last few weeks. A few things I wanted to point out um, are we have the telemedicine policies and procedures. And Yvonne, my colleague who is on with me today, we're going to go over just a few of these. But it's in this section on our website, which is simply textmed.org forward slash telemedicine. All of these policies and procedures, and I'm going to open uh, just this first one, administration and billing. And I want you to see that these are all in Word documents, so you can take them and you can adapt them to your practice however you need to. And so we have this information in here. You're welcome to take this, adapt it as needed. Um, if you would like to add your practice logo to it, um, that is perfectly appropriate. Yvonne, do you want to take a second if I um, go back and just scroll through these and do you want to say a few words about some of them? Are there any additional ones you'd like to open up? Uh, not necessarily open them, but Shannon, you're, you're not sharing the actual document on the screen. You have to, you have to go back to share screen and, and choose it. Ah, doing the website, so they haven't seen the document itself yet. Okay, so if I stop share and then go to it and share again, does that show it now? Yes, there you go. Okay, okay. thank good, you. Good. So I'll talk through that. So each of these is created with um, in the same format, where, where you'll have a purpose, policy, and procedure. Um, and the purpose just explains why it exists. What's the point? Um, the policy explains kind of like the brief um, um, uh, statement of this is how things will be done um, and this and, and according to whomever. And then your procedure really is that step-by-step -step process. So um, when Stacy was talking earlier about developing protocols, um, this is where they actually get documented. You, you really need to write those protocols down step-by-step. -step. And the policies and procedures help you for a number of reasons. Um, one, it helps you to really um, nail down your workflow and, 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 and think about it step by step. Um, it, it also helps you uh, develop um, an actual orientation training tool for your staff to use. Um, or in the very beginning of the process, once everybody's been trained on the protocols and maybe somebody forgets something, they can go back to that document and go, oh, okay, that's the that's what I have to do in that part of the process. Um, that way, everybody in your practice is on the same page. Everybody is doing the same thing all the time. So you have consistency in your processes. And then, and then last but not least, um, which is something that we tend to not really think about because fortunately it doesn't um, affect us all in our daily practice, but when it does affect you, it's huge. And that's the risk management piece. Um, it's really very important that you have policies written, procedures written, that your staff is trained on those policies and procedures, that they're, they're following those policies and procedures, because if something does happen and a patient were to bring some type of lawsuit forward, you're able to say at that point, um, we followed policy, we followed procedure. It's kind of your backup. Um, so you'll see as Shannon's going through there, some, some policies that are more clerical and clinical, and uh, I'm, I'm sorry, clerical and administrative um, that have to do with things like billing and, and scheduling and things of that nature. 
And then you'll see there are also some that are a little more related to clinical functions, such as um, you know, who you're selecting, what type of conditions you're selecting for telemedicine, um, which kinds of patients or types of uh, conditions um, are appropriate for televisits, um, your, um, how, how you're going to deal with prescribing medication management, things of that nature. Um, and, and then of course, there's also provider to provider communication. Um, lower down there, you'll see similar to what Stacy was talking about with some of those patient-facing forms and, and physician-facing forms. We have some of those quick reference charts for um, payers, uh, not for payers, but about payers, really. Um, and then a quick reference sheet for patients. That would be a template, something that you could customize, just as you can customize all of these policies and procedures. But even with the quick reference sheets, you could customize that to your process, to your technology, to whatever. And that's a, form, that's a, a document or a flyer, pamphlet, if you will, that you can give to your patient when you're talking to them about um, telemedicine in your practice. There's also a quick reference sheet for your practices. Um, these are things that, again, people that, you're, um, that are involved in the process of telemedicine in your practice can use if they need a quick reference to remember how to do something or what to do about a certain situation. And so again, you wanna customize that to make it um, relevant to your practice. Um, and then just some other types of forms. And again, they're, they're in Word documents. More than likely, you would put these um, in some type of digital format, whether it be on your, um, um, whether it's on like a shared drive or whether it's on your EMR or um, your telemedicine platform um, or on your patient portal or your website. So just some, some, just some things to think about um, in terms of um, information gathering, whether that's from your patients or keeping a log of your referrals, things of that nature. Um, so that's what's on that page. And it is, uh, as Shannon said, all in Word documents, publicly available at textmed.org backslash telemedicine, or slash telemedicine, sorry. Is that a backslash? I can't ever remember. Yeah, <laughs> forward slash. Thank forward you. slash, there you go. Thank you, Yvonne. Mm -hmm. And then do you want to talk briefly about the um, roles and responsibilities within the practice? Yes, and if you'll let me, I'll share my screen here. Uh, let's see. All right, I think that's the one. All right, can everybody see that? Yes, looks good. Marvelous. Okay, so their their roles and responsibilities are uh, important in a couple of different areas of your telemedicine um, process or implementation thereof. So you've got the beginning phases, um, and and Stacy touched on this a little bit, where you have those first steps where you're 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 doing all of your planning and and all of your pre work to uh, implement your telemedicine. So just some things about. Who needs to be involved in those? You know, in that first step, you're trying to define what your needed services are. Where's your gap? Um, this would be um, really, really anybody in your practice would be involved, but you need some folks that are um, willing to take ownership of the project. That might be your providers. You might have a provider champion on staff or your practice administrator. There may be even um, your staff members that can tell you, your clinical staff, your scheduling staff, those folks can tell you where those gaps are and, and help you um, um, see where there might be some, some needs for telemedicine service. Then in your organization and your readiness assessment, you, know, you need to, to, to determine who is um, interested and willing to provide telemedicine in your practice. Do you have um, um, ancillary support services like registered dietitians, um, and uh, LCSWs, doing behavioral health, um, are your NPs, PAs going to be doing telemedicine? So you want to think about who's all going to be involved and who's going to be interested in, in using it. Um, and then again, you want champions in each of those areas of your staff, of your organization, that will help um, the, the rest of their folks uh, in their department come alongside. Um, and then when you get to the point where you're choosing your platform, um, looking at your equipment, acquiring equipment and things of that nature, um, who will be using that equipment? And where in the office will they be located when they're using that equipment? Do you need 
tablets that are mobile? Do you need laptops? You know, how, do you have video equipment that's appropriate? If you're in a, in a situation where you're having to look at um, maybe, you know, you need some high definition video quality for skin lesions or something of that nature, how is that equipment going to be used and who is going to be using it? Um, and, and who is going to be responsible for uh, really understanding all of the IT pieces and, and managing the troubleshooting, that type of thing. And then when you get down to the paperwork and policies and procedures, you know, who's going to take care of um, any licensing and credentialing that you might have to do with if you have private payers that um, want to see specific documents and, and have those included, who's going to be responsible for that type of thing, um, and who's going to take responsibility for drafting and customizing and or customizing those um, policies and procedures. Then you get down to your workflow. And this is where you've, you're at the point of implementing and you're deciding on those protocols that Stacy was talking about. Um, you know, your front desk staff, your clerical staff can deal with scheduling. They can also assist with educating your patients on the availability of the telemedicine, helping them, um, you know, uh, have the pro uh, giving them the proper links, whether that's via email or whether it's in a pamphlet, something like that. Um, and then, of course, they're involved with payment collection potentially. And again, some of these roles and responsibilities will be dictated by the technology you're using, how those platforms are set up. Um, so just keep that in mind that the point is you want to be flexible and creative. Um, your clinical staff, they can do some pre-visit work with patients, um, like Stacy was referring to earlier, um, or you can have them start the telemedicine visits and do that med, med reconciliation and reason for visit history. You can also include that information on a patient portal um, if you're using a patient portal and have patients go in and do that information ahead of time. Again, how you develop that workflow and who's involved will depend on the technology you're using. Um, your medical assistants can do some um, patient education following a telemedicine visit. You know, if you've gone over something with your, your, um, your patient, you can hand it off to uh, a, a, an MA, a nurse, or whomever to complete patient education um, so that you can move on to see the next patient, whether that's a virtual patient or an in-person patient. Um, your clinical staff can also be um, taught how to schedule the visits so that once they finish with the patient, uh, providing any type of instructions or whatever, they can schedule their follow-up visit right then and there. And then lastly, your business office staff, um, they can uh, have, certainly have a role, an appropriate role in doing insurance verification and um, investigating coverage of telemedicine services, um, you know, because it, it is at this point in time, hopefully this will get better in the future, but um, with private payers in particular, it can vary from, from one payer to the next. And then you've got employer-sponsored plans, and it just can be um, just such a, a, a range of coverage. So having your billing office do some of that footwork will help make sure you're getting paid for your visits. Um, and they can also provide patient education of the availability of telemedic telemedicine and the telemedicine coverage. Um, they can um, stay up to date on the coding and, and dealing with um, um, the, the appropriate billing mechanisms and things. And then they can also be um, a part of payment collection. Perhaps they um, provide some of that service up front before the visit starts rather than your front desk people. Just again, depends on your complement of staff, the amount of staff you have and the technology you're using. And that's all I have, thank you. And I need to stop sharing, there we go. Thanks, Yvonne. Excellent information. And thank you for your work on those policies and procedures. Yvonne is the brainchild behind those and spent a lot of time developing those. So thank you for your work on that. Thanks. We will all benefit. Um, I want to now, we have, you know, some time left and I know that there are still questions coming through, but wanted to get just a few words from physicians in the trenches over their experience in the last week. And um, Dr. Valenti, I would love to call on you just to tell us briefly how it's been for you over the last few weeks. Hey there. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, thanks everyone for being on. Um, last few weeks have been very interesting, trying to uh, coordinate patient visits and then putting off patients who are having surgery, um, 
especially patients who are having a lot of pain and who want surgery. The Texas Medical Board came out last night with an indication that they would not only will pursue doctors uh, 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 doing anything elective or what they consider elective, uh, but now the doctor only has seven days to respond to a complaint instead of 28 days. So they're really, really coming down super hard here. Um, I have a patient currently that has a lot of pain, but they, they, the hospitals told me no. And so now it's pain management, but at least we can do that with the new guidelines. We can prescribe opioids without having a patient visit, which is a relaxation. Um, one thing I'm noting is that uh, visits uh, are extended a bit because um, with almost every patient we're asking about COVID. So, you know, that there is a, a code, a screening code for an encounter to discuss COVID. Um, there is a ICD code, I should say, for that. And so I'm including that on a lot of my visits. And interestingly, even on some visits where they would be no pay visits like a post-operative visit, um, if I spend more than 50% of the time discussing COVID, that then becomes a paid visit. So that's something to be aware of as well. Uh, I know everyone's looking for some tips and tricks as we're all trying to stay afloat here. Uh, so uh, trying to do that with some of my patients or really they're initiating it is a big one. Um, we have Hilo agent uh, through HCA, and that has actually been extremely smooth. Uh, there's almost no learning curve. Uh, we're doing both phone and telehealth visits without any difficulty. We have templates uh, built in that the MAs put in. Medical assistants do all the history and everything ahead of time. We just go ahead and confirm that when we speak to the patient. I am able to glean a lot of things on the physical exam visually. For my post-operative patients, I am able to look at incisions and even share with them their laparoscopic photos by sort of holding them up to the pick the pick, the, the the video and going here's your uh, tube here's your ovary you know so we're able to do that sort of stuff visually and patients are okay with that um, I think patients are generally pretty happy with how things are going and I think they're also happy that we are very concerned about their ongoing health especially with the COVID questions in addition to the standard questions so uh, not much issue with that. Um, we're not sure about uh, payment equity for nurse practitioners and certified nurse midwives, and maybe I'll let someone else chime in on that because we are still doing OB. We're doing drive-up OB visits now where you stay in your car, and we'll come out outside the building and listen to fetal heart tones and do measurements. Uh, we're doing vaccinations and immunizations outside, uh, so the nurse is coming out to give you your Depo-Provera or your Gardasil or whatever it is, uh, so we're, we're adapting. Um, but I think it really it's, uh, uh, people have been pretty uh, flexible about how it's working, and I think they're just happy to have any care at all right now and have access to their physician. So I would say uh, Dr. Libby has been quite prophetic uh, about the need for this, uh, as well as uh, physician wellness and moral injury is obviously another big topic. It's not what this is about, but he's been very uh, leadership uh, driven on both of these issues. So way to go, Russ. Um, but at, at TMA, I think we're doing a good job. And of course, I'll be bringing, as your board of trustee member from TMA, I will be bringing all of this information to the board of trustee meeting tomorrow when we have a Zoom meeting. We're having a meeting once a week. So uh, we'll be talking about that as well tomorrow. So thanks for the chance to chime in. Thank you, Dr. Valente. Uh, Dr. Howard from Florida, would you like to say a few words? Sure. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, this is a great conference so far. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, telehealth and been for a very long time. And my practice may be a little bit different, solo practice uh, setting, mostly a, a hybrid type practice. So we take insurance and also have uh, some subcontracts as well with patients. And uh, this has been incredible. I, I basically was able to go from seeing patients in my office to 100% online without any difficulty. Um, even my 92-year-old patients uh, get on. For those who absolutely can't, I, I use whatever they, they can, uh, telephone or even just email if I have to, or I will see a few people. But uh, this, is, this is an incredible thing. I think the, the most important uh, point to uh, really understand about this is this is an opportunity, an opportunity for physicians uh, to really engage the patients in helping them understand how great this is for them uh, from a time standpoint and many others. And uh, I think it's maybe one of the few things that we can do to get uh, patients on our side to discuss with legislators 
so that this is something that stays where it's at. I don't want to see any decrease in, in, in value. I mean, physicians have a tendency to overthink everything. And so I think we have to keep it very simple. We have to absolutely have it so that, you know, we are paid at the same par rate. Um, in my practice, what I do is um, maybe different than other people, but um, I spend 30 minutes with every single patient at a minimum and an hour for new patients. I see new patients. Um, you know, I was a board certified gastroenterologist. I'm an internist. I do many other things. And so I pull in whatever tools necessary uh, at the time uh, that I'm talking to them. And uh, I think that there's going to be great utility for this moving forward. It also can't be everything for everybody. I hear some questions about physical exam and, and other things. And, and yeah, great. I mean, technology in the future is going to enhance that. And there are already some devices. But uh, being able to touch a patient in, in certain uh, things that we have to do, you know, acute, acute diseases and things like that, are still going to need to be there. So it's going to be a, a hybrid between uh, what telehealth could be and more. I think it also increases the communication with patients, which is really the thing that breaks down care the most. And therefore, being able to communicate and get paid for it is going to be the biggest thing that can happen to medicine in the future, no matter what, uh, whatever else happens. So th this has been extremely helpful. The coding part is still a question. Uh, you know, there's even as I mentioned that you know, even in the booklet on page 102, there's a question of, of you know, which code you're using, 11 or, or point of service uh, 2 which is what I do. I've been paid at a, at 100% the rate that I've been paid previous using that, that uh, methodology. And we'll see how it goes. Obviously, our state payers we're working on, uh, and we need probably more simplicity nationwide for that. The last part is uh, looking at crossing state lines. You know, right now it's very lax. Uh, we have to see how to put that genie back in the bottle and uh, national licensure and other things like that. So that there, it opens up other issues to uh, discuss, but overall, it's been extremely helpful. The last thing is, um, everybody has an electronic medical record. I don't really feel like paying extra, extra, extra fees, you know, to use their clunky system. Uh, basically, it should be just be a user interface, a bidirectional user interface between a patient that's HIPAA compliant. Obviously, uh, uh, you know, Apple hasn't signed the BAA, so the question is whether or not they will or not, which would make it much easier for everybody because that's a usable platform, but. For now, I think the most important thing is uh, maintaining connection with the patients, finding ways to get paid for it and continue paid for it, and making sure it doesn't go away. And I think the only way that we do that is by engaging the public, uh, because the physician voice alone uh, doesn't generally get it done. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Howard. Excellent feedback. And then Dr. Atkinson from Massachusetts, would you like to say a few words about your experience? I think Dr. Atkinson's mic is off. Um, is Dr. Jefferson on? Yes, Dr. Jefferson is here. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, um, our experience in the office has, um, has I think, uh, been very good so far. We, we're, we're, we're still trying to figure things out in terms of um, process in the office. We've settled on DoxyMe clinic version for now. Um, we are using FaceTime when patients have an Apple iPhone. Uh, we find that easier. Um, we've had some glitches with DoxyMe. For some reason, it just suddenly turns off, and then we've had to get back on. Um, the other day, we started with uh, our office manager uh, initiating the visit on DoxyMe and then, tr and then transitioning over to our medical assistant to do a medication reconciliation and, uh, and other things and then transitioning to me. Um, so we're, so um, we seem to be figuring out a process. Um, we, have a, uh, we have a lot going on obviously in this environment. Um, right now, but we seem to be doing pretty well. Uh, I think our telemedicine visits range from eight uh, a day to maybe 16 this week. Dr. Atkinson, I see your mic is now off if you want to add a few words. Thank you. Hi. Yes, thank you. When this first started, I actually contacted our legislators. Can you all hear me? Um, and 
um, they were really proactive and went to, um, so it was the leadership from our Mass Medical Society and two of our um, local legislators went to the governor's office who immediately made a decree stating that all telemed visits, including telephone calls, needed to be covered with no out-of-pocket expenses for patients, including co-pays and deductibles. That was huge and was started really early before most of the doctors in our area were using telemed. Um, so I feel like big kudos to the MMS legislative staff and our government for taking that on. Um, we've still had to hold some of their feet to the fire on this. Some of the insurance companies wanted to only pay for COVID visits by telemedicine, but we insisted that seeing patients uh, by telemed visit, keeping them out of the ER for any reason was worth it, and most of them have gone along. So um, that's been a big plus for us. Um, we've actually put in place some uh, processes that have made things easy. Initially, what we did was we sent our one pregnant provider home and had her do all the telemed visits. Um, and she found it was a ton of work because we were used to having our clinical staff room the patient, get at the history and everything. So with the, we then changed the process so that our clinical staff call every patient and pre-screen. We get their medications, ask them to get their blood pressure, their blood sugar. Um, we even now have them screening things that we would normally do in the office. For instance, a follow-up ADHD visit, we have them fill out the ADHD screening form. Um, or tell the peak flows, that type of thing. Um, and we've now taken it one step further where we now have a clinical staff person sitting next to the receptionist. The receptionist books the visit, then the clinical staff person does the pre-screening um, because we have almost no patients in our office. Uh, we went from seeing about 300 patients in a day in our office to about two. Um, so our clinical staff were bored and this is working really well. Um, I think those are my pearls, thank you. All right, thank you. Meg, do we want to take maybe just one or two questions before we close out the day? Yeah, I think that sounds great. I'm echoing a little, but um, one question that I see still seems unanswered is uh, Kuling was wondering if anyone has been seeing or using any patient satisfaction surveys like specific to telehealth. So Meg, I'll weigh in here on that. We actually do have a sample one within the playbook that we've put together five questions, obviously not embedded into any existing survey right now, but certainly, you know, something that you can use, whether it's just um, emailing it to them after based on, you know, the situation that you have in your own practice, but we do have kind of a downloadable tool um, related to patient satisfaction. Um, and then I did want to just quickly touch on Dr. Howard's mention of the code in the playbook as well. Um, on our navigating coding and payment resource within the playbook, we did make the decision to keep that uh, specific to pre-COVID, um, just in case all of these changes are, are rolled back. Um, so that is pre-COVID. However, um, there is a, a little author's note you'll see at the top of that resource that actually um, links you to the quick guide that we developed, which is the um, kind of a very truncated version of the playbook with the latest updates with all of the codes and payment um, processes right now. And we fully um, intend to kind of revisit and make updates to the playbook after uh, you know, in the months to come, um, recognizing that as an industry, we're learning so much right now. And we're very hopeful that some of these expansions, in fact, do stick around, and then we'll be able to make those adjustments then. So just wanted to kind of touch on that too, because I saw that in the chat box as well. Great. Thanks, Stacey. Um, one other question was related to just clarification for whether nurses and case managers um, can you know, bill, especially without a provider visit. Um, so Dr. Silva, would you mind commenting on that? Yeah, th th I'm, glad, I'm glad to do my best. So there was some language in the interim final rule that was specific to supervision. So for example, one of the laxities that was provided was in the hospital where the previous requirements that it was that a physician had to be supervising the patient, now that requirement has been waived. There's some changes regarding direct supervision versus general supervision, and they've sort of lessened those also. And then lastly, there's some language about 
incident two types of services where previously the physician would potentially have been able to bill those and now those requirements have been changed. So if the physician's not directly involved, they can still bill. I don't want to comment too specifically beyond that because I'm still actually, frankly, still dissecting that sure. part of the rule. Yeah. But I do think it's an important question for us to put on the books to try to answer pretty quickly, Meg. Yeah, great. Um, you know, for purposes of time, I think a lot of the other things, you know, can be slight, you know, slightly additional clarifications as we go here. But um, as Bridget and team noted, we're planning to aggregate all of the key comments and questions from this and we'll be following up as well as sharing out the recording from the day. But, you know, on my behalf and on behalf of AMA, I mean, can't thank you enough for all the work that you're doing on the front lines right now. And just to let you know that we're here for, you know, anything that you need and please feel free to reach out to any of us directly with any questions as things go. And we're really looking forward to continuing the telehealth initiative and just thank you for all the work that you're doing. Thank you, Meg. With that, I would just like to say as far as next steps, we do have our next webinar scheduled for April 23rd, Thursday, April 23rd, um, entitled Redesigning Your Practice. And I realize there's a lot going on now around COVID, but we do need to keep our eye on the, the long-term vision so that once all of this is over and, and some of the regs are rolled back, that we do have the right things in place when we get back to whatever our, our normal will be. And then also a reminder that we still will do an in-person meeting on August 28th and 29th in Austin. Um, we will take a little bit of a different focus because I think at that point we can look back on these experiences over these last few months um, at that point and look at how we can refine um, how telehealth is used within the practices. So please make sure that's on your calendar um, at that time. As far as CME, again, this was approved for two and a half hours of CME. Uh, for each of the, the states, if you will let your state lead know that you participated, it is for those that participated live. We will have a recording of this preserved. I have to confess that I started the recording about 13 minutes in, so a little bit of it we did miss, so my apologies for that, but we started it as we were starting with Dr. Libby's presentation, so the, the meat of the program is there. Um, thank you, thank you. I know you are all so busy, so thank you for the time you devoted this morning to this. And we are available to answer additional questions as you think of them, um, put it out to all of our experts to help as much as we can. And with that, we will conclude the meeting and have a great rest of your weekend. Thanks again. Bye, everybody. Thank you, guys.